When we talk about the transport of the future, we often imagine something like this or this. But what if I told you that with a high probability, the transport of the future will look like this? Now you might ask, isn't this the distant past? And you would be right. Airships were actively used at the beginning of the 20th century, becoming the first commercial aircraft used for transporting cargo and passengers. Airships regularly crossed the Atlantic, and in 1929, the Graf Zeppelin even completed the first circumnavigation of the globe. However, after a series of disasters and with the development of heavier-than-aircraft, airships gradually faded from the scene, losing out in the competitive struggle to faster airplanes. Nevertheless, today, almost 100 years after the last commercial flight in 1937, airships are back in the spotlight. And it is quite likely that very soon we will see these sky behemoths in our skies again. Why is this technology, which seemed to have faded away, back in the spotlight today. The reason lies in certain technological advancements that have significantly increased the safety and efficiency of these transportation vehicles. Among these achievements, the most notable is the cheapening of helium production technologies, which made it possible to replace the explosive hydrogen that filled the early airships. In addition, modern lightweight and durable materials such as titanium, carbon fiber, Kevlar, Mylar, and similar materials can be used to manufacture airships. Another reason for the renewed interest in airships is the current trend towards ecological friendliness. At least theoretically, airships can be equipped with environmentally friendly electric motors. Yes, airships still cannot and never will be able to compete in speed with airplanes or in maneuverability with helicopters. Nevertheless, there is definitely a market niche for their use, which upon examination may not be as small as one might think. Indeed, the airplane is the fastest, but also the most expensive way to deliver goods from point A to point B. Yes, aboard an airplane, your cargo can cover thousands of kilometers in just a few hours and reach another part of the world within a day, but this speed comes at a cost, and a substantial one. At the other extreme is maritime transport, it is the cheapest, but also the slowest, with the delivery time for cargo stretching into months. Railway and road transport occupy an intermediate position. Trucks are more expensive, but faster. Railways are slower, but cheaper. Depending on the cargo specifics, logistics features, routes, and other factors, the choice of transportation method often involves combining several modes of transport within a single shipment meaning work is done by airplanes, trucks, and cargo ships. Airships have quite interesting characteristics from this perspective. Capable of cruising at speeds of around 150 kilometers per hour, they are second only to airplanes in this respect. As for cost, optimistic estimates suggest it could be around 20 cents per ton per kilometer, comparable to the cost of transportation by road. This is because, unlike airplanes, airships do not require any effort to stay in the air. In the atmosphere, they have zero or even positive buoyancy, simply because they are what they are, and all the fuel an airship consumes is used for propulsion. In this sense, airships are rightly called flying ships. Moreover, airships have a whole range of additional advantages. Unlike airplanes, they do not require airports with long runways, and unlike road and railway transport, they do not require roads. They can land on water or not land at all. Essentially, they can just hover over the destination and unload or load any cargo from the ground using various lifting equipment, which allows them to easily establish cargo transportation links, including with remote and hard to reach regions, regions where normal transportation links are disrupted due to natural disasters or other reasons. Additionally, they have unmatched potential for transporting oversized cargo, such as giant wind turbine blades or similar items. Essentially, an airship can transport anything that allows it to lift off the ground, and if it doesn't fit in its cargo hold, the cargo can simply be attached beneath its underside. Airships have good potential for passenger transport as well. While they are unlikely to be used for long distance flights, crossing the Atlantic, for example, would take them four to five days. Airships could find applications in short regional flights spanning a couple of hundred kilometers. They are substantially cheaper than airplanes, yet noticeably faster and more comfortable than buses or trains.
Moreover, airships are significantly safer than many other modes of transportation. For instance, even if an airship's envelope is punctured and it begins losing gas and lift, it will not plummet to the ground like a stone. Instead, in most cases, it will descend relatively smoothly and be capable of executing a relatively soft landing, ensuring the survival of passengers. All of this sounds quite impressive. However, airships do have a number of problems, not unsolvable, but serious enough to justify a certain skepticism. But first, let's understand how an airship is constructed and how it flies. Airships are a type of lighter than air aircraft, meaning that their lift is generated by filling the airship's envelope with gas, the density of which is less than that of the surrounding air at the same pressure. According to Archimedes' principle, such gas tends to rise in denser atmospheric air, thus lifting the airship, its payload, and passengers. Airships come in two types, soft and rigid, distinguished by the construction of their external envelope. In soft airships, the envelope is simply a large container made of elastic material filled with lighter-than-air gas. The pressure of the gas inside, the atmosphere outside, and the elasticity of the envelope give the airship its shape. In rigid airships, the external envelope is stretched over a rigid frame inside which several gas cells are located. Thus, the overall shape of the airship is determined by the shape of the frame. Due to the presence of this frame, a rigid airship of the same size will be heavier than a similar-sized soft airship, meaning it will have less lifting capacity for the same volume. Additionally, soft airships are simpler and cheaper to construct, which is why small airships are usually made in the soft variant. However, airships must simply be large, and the larger, the better. Why is that? The reason lies in aerodynamics and a universal law known as the square cube law. In the flight of a classic airship at a constant speed, the thrust of its engines is mainly spent overcoming air resistance. The magnitude of air resistance is proportional to the surface area of the airship. On the other hand, the mass of the payload an airship can carry is proportional to the volume of the airship. In turn, the surface area of the airship is proportional to the square of its linear size and the volume to the cube of its linear size. In simpler terms, if we take an airship and somehow double its linear dimensions, the mass of the payload it can carry will increase eightfold, while the air resistance to its movement, and therefore the fuel consumption to travel the same distance, will increase only fourfold. In other words, the fuel consumption for transporting a unit of cargo from point A to point B will be halved for a larger airship. That is why, as I mentioned earlier, an effective airship is a large airship. It turns out that creating truly large soft airships is challenging. As we have already discussed, their shape is largely determined by the stiffness of the envelope combined with the gas pressure inside the airship, which stretches this envelope. In other words, the larger the airship, the higher the internal pressure must be, and the stronger, thus thicker, the envelope must be. The thicker the envelope, the heavier the airship will be, and at a certain point, the primary advantage of soft airships essentially disappears. That is why, if you want to create a truly large airship, you still need to make it rigid. The lift of an airship is determined by the amount of helium in its envelope. One cubic meter of helium at atmospheric pressure is capable of lifting approximately one kilogram and 90 grams of payload into the air. For hydrogen, by the way, this figure is higher one kilogram and 180 grams per cubic meter of gas. The more gas you pump into the airship's tanks, the greater its lifting capacity. This method of generating lift is an advantage for the airship because it does not need to expend energy to stay in the air, as is the case with airplanes and helicopters. However, it also creates a whole series of difficulties in airship control. To control any aircraft, we need to be able to change its lift force. For example, if we need to take off, we must increase the lift force to exceed the weight of the aircraft and its payload. And conversely, if we need to descend, we must reduce the lift force. In airplanes, helicopters, or quadcopters, we achieve this by changing the engine settings. However, this does not work the same way for airships. Their lift force exists simply because they are made of specific materials. Typically, in modern airships, the amount of helium is calculated to give the aircraft neutral buoyancy, 
and changes in altitude are achieved through the use of engines and altitude rudders. This is a good approach, but it is only suitable if the airship's mass remains relatively constant during the flight. This method clearly does not work with cargo airships. A loaded airship weighs significantly less than an empty one, and after unloading, you need a way to substantially reduce the lift force. There are several approaches to controlling the lift force of an airship. The first, and most obvious, is simply to inflate the airship's balloons with more gas if we need to rise and release some gas if we need to descend. However, this method inevitably leads to significant gas consumption, which we would literally need to release into the atmosphere from time to time. And if we consider that we are dealing with helium, which costs around $15 per cubic meter, this idea doesn't seem so successful. Theoretically, of course, we could avoid releasing helium into the atmosphere and compress the gas to high density using a compressor, then store it in high pressure tanks on board the airship from which it could be released back into the balloons when needed to increase lift force next time. Unfortunately, currently, we do not have compressors powerful enough to perform this procedure quickly with large volumes of gas. Moreover, these compressors must be relatively lightweight, otherwise, the airship simply cannot lift them. In short, this method is currently beyond our technical capabilities, although who knows, this may change in the near future. However, there are other ways to change the volume of helium in the airship's balloons. Small auxiliary balloons inside the airship's envelope, known as ballonets, are used for this purpose. When we pump more air into them, their volume increases, compressing the helium balloons and reducing lift force. Conversely, if we remove air from the ballonets, causing them to contract, the volume of the main balloons increases and the lift force increases. Unfortunately, in practice, this method is only suitable for making minor adjustments to lift force. For example, to compensate for the decreasing weight of the airship as its engines burn fuel during flight. Compensating for changes in weight during loading and unloading of the airship using this method is somewhat problematic. Another approach is to utilize aerodynamic lift, as mentioned earlier. In this case, you design your airship to be slightly heavier than air by default and equip it with small wings, or give the airship itself an aerodynamic shape. When the airship is flying at a certain speed, additional lift force is generated, allowing the aircraft to overcome gravity. Flight with cargo on board is achieved at high angles of attack, creating greater lift force, and after unloading, you reduce aerodynamic lift to compensate for the airship's decreased weight. Aerodynamic lift can also be created using the airship's engines by changing their position and operation mode, similar to what happens with helicopters or quadcopters. This method is also good. However, the wider the range of weight changes your airship undergoes, the more its lift force will depend on engine operation and the more fuel the airship will burn during flight. As the payload capacity increases, this undermines the main advantage of airships, their efficiency, especially for truly large and heavy lift airships, which, as we mentioned earlier, we should strive for. There is also a fifth method, ballast. Upon reaching the destination and unloading cargo, the airship takes on board something of equivalent weight, perhaps even just water, to maintain the balance of weight and lift force. This method is the simplest and cheapest, but there is a problem. You must be sure that reserves of something suitable for use as ballast are waiting for you at the unloading point, which somewhat limits the flexibility of airships and their ability to deliver cargo anywhere. So yes, solving the lift force problem is possible. However, all of these methods, as well as some others we have not listed here, have their advantages and disadvantages, and engineers must puzzle over which one or which combination of these methods to use in each specific machine. The next issue lies not so much in the physical as in the economic realm, if I may put it that way. Yes, airships are significantly cheaper to operate, but they themselves are quite expensive, roughly two to three times more expensive than airplanes of equivalent payload capacity. This means that to start a business, you would require substantial investments in creating a fleet of airships. And we're not talking about tens, but hundreds, or better yet, thousands of air vessels. Moreover, the cost of the airships themselves is not the only expense. 
you would also need to establish infrastructure for them. For instance, hangars to house these flying behemoths would also need to be enormous, and constructing them in sufficient numbers would not be a cheap procedure. Yes, the prospective costs have a chance to relatively quickly pay off, but first, you need to find people willing to invest tens of billions of dollars in essentially creating a new industry. Despite all these challenges, as well as a range of other smaller complexities, airships for commercial use are actively being developed and built today. One of the most well-known is the Airlander, built in 2012 by British Hybrid Air Vehicles, which was dubbed the Flying Bum due to its distinctive shape. This peculiar form is precisely needed for the airship's envelope to generate lift during flight, as we discussed a little earlier. The Airlander 10 is relatively modest. It measures 92 meters in length, 43 meters in width, can carry about 10 tons of cargo, and can move at speeds up to 148 kilometers per hour at altitudes up to six kilometers. From a structural point of view, the Airlander is a soft airship made of Kevlar and Mylar. The Airlander uses four four-liter diesel engines, each with 325 horsepower. It is capable of flying both in manned and unmanned modes, and according to developers, can stay in the air without landing for up to two weeks. In 2022, the airline Air Nostrum Group ordered 10 airships from hybrid air vehicles, which it plans to use for interregional passenger flights in Spain. The project launch is expected in 2026. Another modern airship project was presented by the American company LTA Research, a brainchild of one of Google's co-founders, Sergey Brin. The company's Pathfinder One airship was unveiled in 2023. The 124-meter airship has a cruising speed of 120 kilometers per hour and belongs to the rigid airship category, meaning it maintains its shape thanks to a rigid frame made of titanium and carbon fiber, inside which helium tanks are placed. Such airships, as we mentioned earlier, are somewhat heavier than soft airships like the Airlander, which results in a payload capacity of approximately five tons for the Pathfinder One. However, this is only a test prototype to refine the technology. LTA Research promises to soon unveil the significantly larger Pathfinder Three, capable of carrying up to 200 tons of cargo. Pathfinder One is propelled by 12 electric motors. Although it's not entirely electric yet, in the current version, the electric motors are powered by a diesel generator. However, the airship's creators say that in the future, the generator can be easily replaced with electric batteries. Other companies, such as the French Flying Whales or the Israeli Atlas LTA Advanced Technology, are banking on the feature of airships being undemanding in terms of landing space, not requiring complex infrastructure for cargo loading and unloading, and so on, which allows them to fly to the most remote and rarely visited places. The Atlant 100 airship from Atlas LTA, at a length of 140 meters, is expected to reach speeds of up to 130 kilometers per hour, carrying up to 60 tons of cargo, which will be housed in a cargo hold with an impressive volume of 2,400 cubic meters. And if the cargo doesn't fit in such a compartment, it can be attached to the airship's hull externally. According to developers' reports, the Atlants will be capable of landing on any reasonably flat surface and anchoring themselves with special anchors, with the ability to land on water as well, reportedly capable of withstanding waves up to five points. The first of these airships are expected to take flight in 2025-2026. Thus, we are literally on the cusp of a new era of airships. Nearly 100 years later, these flying behemoths seem poised to return to the skies, and I personally will be more than interested to observe how all of this can change our lives and the world around us. Well, that's all for today. Take care and see you next time on our channel.